2017, Comfort Air Spirit of Truth, art that we were present and to list all things, treasure you for things, the giver of life. Come and abide in us, cleanse us of all impurity, and save our souls, the good one. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever to the ages of ages. Amen. Right, good evening. I've got, got some handouts for you here. Maybe you just take one and pass it down. And this way around. So we'll start on, uh, we'll be covering chapter four, we'll pick up where we left off, just to um, remind ourselves where we were, um, we, we had just uh, read about and discussed about the healing of the, the lame man uh, at, at the beautiful gates of the temple by uh, Peter and John. Uh, this guy wanting, was, was a beggar, was a well-known beggar uh, that's been uh, lame for 40 years, his whole life. And uh, everyone knows this guy and he's begging for money from Peter and John, who's gone to the temple to do what the Jews are supposed to do, to, to pray at certain times. And so they perform a miracle in Christ's name, in the faith of Christ, and this man's bones are healed. Remember, I, we, we talked about how significant the scripture says about his ankle and feet are forged together. And so it's like this miracle that uh, you can't just, you know, uh, just write off as, a, as maybe something... That, Something that's like a, a, a phantom, you know, you know, thing that to trick people. It's it's truly here. And then Peter gives a a sermon. Remember, he's he's talking to the uh, to those who are there about how this happened, and he's starting to preach about Jesus here. Okay, um, and he's telling that the he's telling the the people there assembled, specifically the Jews, because it's inside the temple at this point uh, about the. Messiah had come, that you guys put him to death, but nevertheless, he's here if they repent and they can receive uh, uh, salvation, okay? So that's where um, chapter 3 in a, in a ends, and so we'll pick up here um, what happens uh, to Peter and John after this. But I wanted to uh, give you a couple handouts so that you could take home with you. The, uh, there's a summary of chapter 4 based upon the church fathers, so... Um, I don't know that I'm going to read through that today, but I, I want you to be able to take it home. It's just a summary points of, of how the fathers read each of these verses. Uh, so there's there's a, a, a paraphrase of, of all the church fathers here throughout, not all of them, but you know significant ones that we understand these passages to. And then the second one is I want to before we get into the text is to set the stage a little bit. Is um, it's a diagram of the temple of so this is, when we hear the, the temple, we have to understand that the temple that was created and built by Solomon no longer stood, right? So it was destroyed by the Babylonians. Jews are in exile. When they come back, this is rebuilt. This is called, this is Herod's temple. So Herod is, he works with, he's, the, he's not in like a lineage of, of, he's actually really not even, true Jewish blood. He's kind of a emogulation, but he comes to power because he works with the Romans, okay? So he has a lot of latitude, but he's also the king. Look, He's looking over Judea at this time. So Herod's, this is Herod's temple. This is the also, also known, you'll also times hear it, the second temple. So this is what it looks like. So it's much more bigger than Solomon's temple. So Solomon's temple, if you look here, is it uh, would be kind of where you see the Holy of Holies. So the interior court where you see um, the, um, so on the left side of the paper, you see this, these different, there's different courts, different rooms to this whole temple here. If you see here, this is where the Holy of Holies is, okay? So that's where, in the past, that's where the tabernacle was, was the Ark of the Covenant was, which is no longer at this point. But this is where the Jews believe that the, the, the God presides uh, on earth, okay? This is where the, the uh, priests will go in and do their service, okay? And you'll see here that there's these different courtyards. So you'll see where the court of uh, the priests are. That's where 
Um, only the priests could go in and assemble here, okay? And then they would go and offer their incense and at certain times into the Holy of Holies, the high priest, okay? And then outside of this, uh, we see what is, the, it's this court of the women or treasury here. So this is, this is where, w at this point, the women could go. Now, it should be understood that there's a place at this point in, in the G Jewish faith there was a place where the women, there was women that were dedicated to the service of the temple. They would be uh, sewing and mending. And so this was, they would not go into this inner part, but they were there at near the temple in service to God, okay? Uh, of whom, in our tradition, is who is part of that service to God? Who's dedicated to God and serving in this manner? The, the, the Theotokos. And the, so this was just women in, in a certain part of this courtyard, okay? So and they lived there, okay, into the service of the temple. Um, this is all this is all historical knowledge. It's not stuff that our tradition just confirms at all, okay? And so you'll see at the very far right, this is where the beautiful gates are that we talked about last week in this chapter where the man was begging, okay? Uh, the beautiful gate where the, the entrance. So you'll see all these entrances. There's, there's, there's 10 entrances into the temple, but this was the main one, okay? And this is where they came through, did the healing. And then uh, you'll see as we talk a little further into what happens, transpires, this, this diagram is helpful to know. Like you can, when you hear it, you can look at this. Oh, this is where they're at in doing this, okay? Right. Any questions on that before we get into the text? Where's the curtain at? The curtain, the veil, is there's a veil from the Holy of Holies inside the inner temple, okay? There's other, I, there, I, not in this diagram, but you'll, you'll see that there's uh, in here, in, in here you'll have a, a wash basin, you'll have the, the altar of incense, you'll have the, the candelabra stands, uh, um, inside you'll have the cherubim. All, all of these are, what you'll, we have them in various manners in our own church, but that they're all, this is not in this diagram, but I could pull one up, it'll show you all that. But you could probably find it on the internet real easy. Google's amazing. So is it just one of these sides of this side was the west wall, what they consider the west wall in Jerusalem? So, so this side here, if you look right here, this is where, this was the, the Kidron Valley. So, you know, when you're in yeah. Jerusalem, there's that big dip that before you go up to Mount Olives where the Kidron River, when we hear it in the Holy Week, you cross the Kidron Valley. It's, it's quite, yeah. you know, expansive. So you'll see this almost on a cliff here. Uh -huh. And so this would be the Western Wall, but I think a lot of archaeologists, a lot of, they, they said that Western Wall is not actually part of this. Okay. It was like rebuilt later. Oh. So it wasn't any part of this. Because it's just Lily, so, is this Lily Gate? Lily is Gate, it, so it would be, it's a different here. one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's it, that Lily Gate was into Jerusalem, okay. not into the temple. So. Got it. All right. So I'm going to start uh, reading, and then um, I'll, I'll make some com comments as we read uh, on these verses, and then I'll go to uh, Archbishop of Verity's commentary to get some um, more uh, more in-depth uh, knowledge here. So, chapter four. So now as they spoke to the people, uh, the priest, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them. So the captain of the temple. So this is, a, again, a, a idea. This is the guard. So there's a there's actual, like, a security guard that would guard the temple. And this was not a feature of the temple originally, but this was in order to keep peace, the, the Romans allowed this. So, you know, the Jews would not have uh, their own police force uh, in Jerusalem, but in order, at the temple, they've, again, you'll see that there's this now, at this point in time, that the authority of the Jews have already have worked in cooperation with the Romans at this time, okay? And we'll get into that more here. The Sadducees are the keepers of the temple. They're, they've now inherited the, right of the high priesthood at this time. Sadducees come from the Old Testament Zadok. That's where the, the priest would, that's the line of the priest. Uh, but these Sadducees now have no blood lineage to Zadok anymore, even though they call themselves the Sadducees. They've, they put themselves in power. They've, they, they've, they've, they've come into power, uh, this line, but they're not 
of like the original temple, okay? So when people say Second Temple Judaism, this is what they mean. Yeah. Okay. Second Temple Judaism. Yeah. It's not it happened right at, It's right not the right same as the first temple. temple. Things have changed, okay? This is Death. yeah. And you'll That's see this changed. is why Christ is always at odds with with okay. people. You know, he's trying to remind people that what you're doing is not of our tradition. Okay. okay. So yeah, this is Second Temple Judaism. And it happened right at his death. Yeah, it was a long period, but uh, uh, inner inner period. But yeah, Christ was in it in the yeah. symbol. Okay. Yeah, this is probably at this event. Just uh, this is probably within a year of Christ's death. Yeah, this is what we're reading right now. Okay. All right. Okay, Be, being greatly disturbed that they uh, taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So they're not mad that they're preaching. They're mad that they're teaching that Jesus rose from the dead, okay? So they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who had heard the word believed, and a number of the men came to be about 5,000. 5,000 at this. These are how many people are congregating here. That's a lot. It's a lot of people to believe at this event. You can see why they were arrested. It's not, not simply because they were preaching, not even simply because they were preaching Jesus and in resurrection. They've convinced 5,000 people. And so the Jewish authorities at this time, it's all about, a, if, you, if you read the Gospels too, it's, it's, it's about power, okay? It's not necessarily about theology. It's not even necessarily about, there is sex in the Judaism at this time. We've talked about this, right? There's various sects of theological range with the, among Jews at this time. So it's not necessarily even their theology or what they're preaching. It's, it's a power. They, they, they don't want to lose power, okay? This is a mass move that's happening real quick, okay? So addressing the Sanhedrin, okay. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, the elders and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as are the family of the high priest were gathered together in Jerusalem. Let's read this. So the rulers, those who are ruling, the elders and scribes. So the elders are from are the ones that are. It comes from like in Moses' time. He 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 he, he had seventy elders uh, like to do the work of judging people and guiding people because he couldn't do it all. Right, his father Jethro, <laughs> step our father in law says, "Yeah, man, you guys have better things to do than listen to all these people." So this is where this the seventy elders, and you'll see why our tradition now we have the seventy apostles, these elders. Um, you'll see that this this is this term elder is actually in Greek is pres. So that's where we get the word priest from. That's where it comes. That's in Greek. That's what it means. That's priest, the elders, the priests, the presbyters. Um, these names. Annas is the high priest right here at this time. Caiaphas, John, and Alexander. What do you what what do you see? What is sticks out to you about these names? Specifically, Alexander. Doesn't sound very Jewish, does it? No. no. Again, this goes that the, these high priests are now with the authorities. They have now blended in to uh, the rulers of the time. Okay, it, it, they've they've made an agreement in order to keep the peace that they'll, you know, succumb to the rule of the Romans and at the before that the Greeks. And so you see their family names and they're already well with they're already Hellenized, Romanized uh, Jews. Okay. All right, so. And when they had set them in the mist, they asked, by what power or by name have you done this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people, elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to this helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all that all the people of Israel, that the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, and by whom this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, and there is no other name under which, under heaven given among men, by which we must be saved. So again here, 
Uh, Luke has pointed out that Peter is filled with the Holy Spirit. Remember, uh, he is, he's, um, he's speaking with boldness now that he has, and, he's, and again, he's saying that this is done by Jesus. It's not up me. He's giving all the glory to Jesus Christ, and he's reminding them once again that you crucified him. He is the Christ, right? Remember, Christ means Messiah. He is the Messiah. That's just what it means in, 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 uh, in Hebrew. And so he says in, the, he, point in verse 11 here, he says um, that he's quoting a Psalm 118. So just one verse. Remember, there's no chapters and verses, in the, but he's telling, he's fulfilling Psalm 18 here, that Christ is the chief cornerstone. You rejected him, but he is, everything stands upon Christ. He is the stone. He is the rock uh, that, we're, we're, that he's now going to preach, okay? so let me i'm gonna turn my attention to some commentary from father uh, uh archbishop of Verki on the first few passages here so um he says that irritated by the preaching of saint peter the priests, the sadducees the leaders of the temple guard seize the apostles and imprison them until the morning the priests were upset that the apostles instructed the people in the temple without having any lawful authority to do it. See, again, it's all about power. It's authority. The guards were upset that the large crowd of people was disturbing the order of services. And the Sadducees were upset that Peter was teaching about the resurrection, which they rejected. So the Sadducees at this point, they differ from the Pharisees in many ways, but mainly in the theological sense. They don't believe in a bodily resurrection. Okay, uh, they are not seeing him in the prophets. Their sect of Judaism believes you die, you're done. Okay, so you would see why they want to profit themselves and have authority and, and have a live a good life and, and have a nice, uh, uh, you know, luxurious lifestyle. When it's done, it's done. Okay, so you, you can see why they they differ from the Pharisees in this manner. Okay, so the Sadducees. Uh, they, are, they interpreted Peter's sermon and laid hands on them, of course, with the permission of the Sanhedrin, which is the council, okay, the, the, the elders of the, the councils. Because it was already late, there was no time to call a session of the Sanhedrin to judge the apostles. They were in prison until the next day. The representatives of the Jewish authority treated the apostles as their enemies. The simple people were so inspired, the apostles' sermon that 5,000 were converted they believe St. Luke stresses not because of this miracle, but because of Peter's address. So um, he points out that it's not, the, not necessarily the miracle, but that Peter is so on fire with the Holy Spirit in preaching that he converts them with his, this, the power of his speech. They probably uh, um, were prepared for every, uh, everything that the apostles had been doing from the day of Pentecost and likely impressed by the unique way of the life of the first Christians, which inspired universal respect and love, okay? He goes on, um, he goes on to say, uh, 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 during the meeting that the Sanhedrin took place, so this is obviously a formal full session, and the judgment over the apostles was considered very important. Among them was the re uh, retired high priest Annas, as well as Caiaphas, who had condemned Jesus to death. We, we recognize that name, right, from Holy Week. Also present were heretofore unknown in the gospel narrative, John and Alexander, members of the high priest family, and most likely had significant authority in the Sanhedrin at the time, being related to the high priest. Having placed the accused in the midst as it was customary, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? Members of the Sanhedrin, of course, knew that the apostles performed the miracle in the name of Jesus Christ. But they wanted the apostles to incriminate themselves in heresy, blasphemy, or even seditious intentions. Or perhaps they hoped for the apostles would simply recant in fear. They did the same thing to, to Christ at his judgment, right? They were just waiting and waiting uh, for him to... They were bringing in these false accusers, to, but they were just waiting for Christ. And Christ finally says, you know what? <laughs> He says, I am who I am, right? You're going to see me. And then he, he says, let's just get this thing done with, you know, this Christ. So they're, they're, they're playing like this legality game. They're waiting for someone to slip up so they can accuse them and, and condemn them. And they're doing the same thing to the apostles here. 
Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Holy Spirit to defend the just cause, as Jesus Christ promised to his disciples. St. Peter answered the question with unique power, directness, and boldness, still giving respect to lawful authority, even though it was unworthy. He began with reverential address to the rulers and the people and the elders of Israel. Okay, so let's, let's hear about what he says. So now when they, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained, I'm here at verse 13, okay, were untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. So they, again, this is one year from, removed from Jesus' crucifixion, but Peter is running away, okay? They're, he's running away from the very high court that he was with at Jesus. Remember, he was in the court at this very place, and he ran away in fear. Uh, and they know that they're Galilean, fishermen, uneducated, probably considered stupid and dumb compared to these, these uh, cosmopolitan, educated high priests, these theologians, okay? So now they're marveling that how can this man speak the way he, he is speaking? He's speaking so erutely, like, you know, he knows he can, he, can, he can probably outwit any of these people now because of the Holy Spirit transformed them. So they're marveling at this, okay? And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. So <laughs> if they wanted to say anything, they could say, well, this guy, we all know this guy here is standing next to him. Uh, they, how can they refute this miracle? Okay, But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do with these men? For indeed, that notable miracle has been done through this is evident. And to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it, but so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things that we have or seen or heard. So they're threatened. They say, you cannot preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And so they, again, Peter's full of the Holy Spirit and, and, and he's got this great wisdom because of it. He says, well, he poses a question. He says, well, it's for you to judge. Am I supposed to uh, listen to you or listen to God? Because in his mind, Christ is God. He is Lord. Am I not supposed to listen to the Lord? He's asking him in a way. It's kind of like a rhetorical question. Okay. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. Okay, So they had to let them go because, again, 5,000 people now are believing. And to do anything would cause, if they know, if you knew anything from the Holy Week, they're uh, the, the Romans do not like this fussiness. They don't want people revolting, right? And so they let's just let them go, okay, and rebuke them. So what, uh, let's, let's see what um, Bishop Verki has to say about these. These, uh, <sighs> these words made such a strong impression regarding Peter's uh, um his defense here on the members of the Sanhedrin that they did not know how to judge the apostles. They were amazed, first of all, the unusual boldness of Peter's confession of Christ before the whole Sanhedrin. Effectively, he had switched roles with them, no longer the accused, but the accuser, charging them with the death of Christ. They wondered at his boldness and his oratory, seeing that both he and John were uneducated and untrained men, they recognized in them the disciples of Christ were assured that they were continuing the work of Jesus, which was so abhorrent to them. At this time, 
The presence of the healed man placed a seal of silence on their lips. They could say nothing to contradict the reality of the miracle performed by the apostles. So could you imagine Caiaphas having sentenced Jesus to death less than a year ago, thinking that this thing is done, we put this to bed, and now they're here doing the same thing in the name of the same man. You can understand they're, they're like, oh my God, what are we going to do with these people? So that's the dilemma they're having right now. It wasn't done. And so they see that as a continuation of Jesus' ministry. They, the, even the Sanhedrin sees it right now. Okay? So they see, they see the church fulfilling this ministry already okay, of Jesus. Having been placed in this difficult position, they sent out the apostles to confer. They were seized with an indecision, evidently as a result of everything that had occurred recently, beginning with the resurrection of Christ. It is possible that among them were people like Joseph of Arimathea, Nicodemus, for whom the reason their decision was quite mild. All they did was forbid the apostles to speak at all or teach in the name of Jesus. So he's saying that there is probably Joseph, Arimathea, that secret followers of Christ may be still among the Sanhedrin as the time when Christ was crucified. Clearly, this was a decision of people much disconcerted by circumstances. St. John Chrysostom comments on this. He says that persuaded that he was risen and having received proof of it, they expected that he whom death could not hold could be cast into the shade of their machinations. What can match the folly of this? Such is the nature of wickedness. It is no eyes for anything, but all the occasions it is thrown into perturbation. So, with amazing courage and boldness, the apostles answered, What is it right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God you judge? Moreover, they openly said that they could not stop preaching about the events to which they were eyewitnesses. The Sanhedrin's fear of the people further prevented them from harming the apostles. And Peter and John were set free. Here we see an obvious moral victory for the apostles, but also the threatening signs of imminent persecution for their faith, which was to befall the apostles themselves and the first generation of Christians. The apostles' answer to the Sanhedrin gives us a clear indication of how to act when earthly powers require us to do something contrary to the divine law and our conscience. We must never go against God's law or the guidance of our conscience merely to curry favor with earthly rulers. I was pondering on this today um, when I, uh, in preparing for the, the study, uh, you know, that we're called to follow God's will and not people in authority, um, not people of, uh, within the church, we can even say this. And I was thinking about how confusing this might sound to a Protestant, somebody who's outside the church. They might pose the same thing to us. Like, are we supposed to listen to God or are you? You're just a people. You're just a, a group of, uh, of uh, believers, right? But you're not God itself. So who are we to listen to? And I was thinking about, well, you know, we, we, often, they, we often read that you know, when they say that, they mean, do we, how do we listen to God when they say that? They're following God from what they read in the scripture, right? We've talked about scripture needs interpretation. It's not plainly understood all the time. And so, and we have to understand too, at this time there was no scripture in the New Testament at least, right? So when they say that, we, 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 you have to also understand that what they're saying is we... we much like Christ said, we, you follow, you listen to the, Christ said this, he says, listen to the Pharisees, but not, but don't do as they do, All right? We, he, always, he was always battling with the Pharisees, but he says that their teachings are legitimate. So, but it, they're, but they're hypocrites because they don't do as they, they, they preach, All right? And so that's the dilemma we have. So sometimes in our church, we are kind of hypocritical. We teach rightly, but we don't do and, and for that instance, we can't disregard the church because, of, because you know, we are, the church is the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit. It guides us, okay? So we have to understand ecclesiology when we're reading this. We have to understand who the church is, okay? God is the church. God is within the church. So when we listen to the church, we're listening to God, okay? All right. So we, that, that's, we're getting close to... 
um, we'll, we'll have, we're about halfway through here. Any questions on so far? There's a, there's a, uh, I, I, I'd say we weren't going to get into this too much, but I do want to uh, point out um, something here that, you know, the church often reads these things and interprets the church fathers allegorically. And so there is um, the passage, uh, which is it? verse 22, 22. It, here they were saying how they can't speak against, even if they wanted to, they couldn't even speak against the apostles because the miracle is evident that, you know, God's with them. This man is standing there. And it says that for this man was over 40 years old, whom this miracle of healing was performed. So fathers see this not insignificant, this age of 40. OK, we, we know we've talked about numberology that the things, uh, you know, 40 is one of those numbers that are seen as a, this perfect, this four times 10. It's this one of these very important that the Hebrews, the Jews understood this. Um, and so even but also the 40, a lot of 40, like we Jesus fasted for 40 days. Right. The Jews uh, wandered in the, uh, the wilderness for 40 years. These all have this. These they're very symbolic. It's a very symbolic number. That's why sometimes you'll hear us say, Lord, have mercy 40 times in church, right? It's, it's just an important number. So uh, St. Bede points this out. It doesn't, he says, uh, this, uh, he gives a historical understanding of, you know, a literal understanding of what that is, but also, you know, a symbolic reading of that. He says, uh, uh, according to the historical sense, this, this shows the, the man's mature age made him, uh, so it shows he was 40 years old, that this was, a, could it just be, by chance, you know, this was a real miracle. This man's 40 years old and he's been like this forever, okay? Um, but allegorically, however, uh, this signifies that the people of Israel not only despised the manna and sought the, the base things of Egypt uh, for the 40 years in the desert, but even the land of promise, they continued always to limp along with the rights of the idols together with those of the Lord. So he's pointing out that he, he's making point that the that this is a, a, a judgment against the Jews. Even they're, they're, they're too, they won't accept this miracle. Much like the manna was a miracle and they complained about it for 40 years and they moaned and groaned and they wished they had the, the finer things back in Egypt, even though they're set free now. They're saying, well, this is another allegory back to this. Here's a, this wonderful miracle and they're, they're not rejoicing in this good thing that's happening. They're mumbling and complaining about it because maybe their authority is now going to be called into question. Okay, so the fathers don't, they don't lose sight of anything when they interpret these things. Father, about what's the time frame between Pentecost and when there's 5,000 here in chapter 4 were following them? Is there... Months to a year. It's obviously yeah. within a year. I don't know uh, exactly. It doesn't, the time frame, but it's probably, it's within a year. Yeah. You know, it's within that year, so. Yeah, as we because we've just gone through like we just went through Pentecost, uh, how the early church was you now people were converting, in, in in their early community, and now right here they're now they're going to the temple. So it's really quick. It's not that long. Yeah, yeah. Just, it'd be within a year. Just kind of curious because there was the three thousand that mm -hmm. believed with Peter's preaching yeah. Pentecost, and now here's another five thousand. In in. And this is what the uh, um, uh, Archbishop of Verki points out too. It's not just Peter's preaching. It's not just the miracle, but they've now these people have heard about this movement, this Christian, it's not even a movement. To them, I, we talked about this at length last week that to the apostles, they're just, they're, they're living their Jewish life, man. <laughs> like this is the faith they've inherited. Uh, they've, they've been waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah is here. It's not, a, you know, it's just, this is it. Yeah. So it's not to them, nothing's different. Uh, it's just convincing others that they, they missed out on the Messiah. But they're living this, that people see that they're, what were they doing? They were living in community. We talked about this, like people are sharing everything. They're in one big, you know, they're showing love and respect to everybody. They're bringing people in. So this is well, probably well understood already. The people that are gathered, they know who they are because they're coming to temple. They're going to synagogues. They see the apostles already. They know their movement. So now they're really, you see the miracle, they see the preaching. 5,000 people, this is why. Now, it's just another, you know, a little chop at the wood, to, you know, that is, that's happening for the community to grow, to grow. All right. Where did I leave off? Yeah, I think verse 23. Thank you. 
Okay. And being let go, they went uh, to their own companions and reported all uh, that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God. You made heaven and earth and the sea and all that there is then. Who by the mouth of your servant David said, why do the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against the Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, Lord, look at their threats. Grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So um, they're praying together. Who are they praying to at this point? The concept of the Trinity is still, it's there. Christ has already put it out there. But in prayer, Christ taught them, you know, they are Father. Who, they're addressing God the Father and thy servant Jesus. And we talked about who the servant was last, what that means, that, that he's a servant, right? The suffering servant, the, the, the suffering servant as, that we see in the prophecy Isaiah, who came to take the sin of the world, okay? And so they're, they're praying to God the Father here. And then... They seem almost like God hears their prayer, and they and, and the uh, there was like a, a shaking, right? So let's 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 delve into to that a little bit. The number of Christian, um, let's see what? Sorry. No sooner had the apostles been released, and they went to their companions to the house where the rest of the apostles and some other faithful were there most likely praying for a positive account of the trial. All were inspired by the apostles' account and the entire assembly as having one mind and one heart turned to God with ardent prayer. This is the first testimony about common Christian prayer that we have. In this prayer, they first of all sought consolation and encouragement, surrendering their whole affair into the hands of God and asking God for the boldness to continue preaching the truth. So they He's saying this is really the first we see that they're, other than the breaking of the bread, this is, we talked about this chapter two, they broke the bread, they said prayers, but like this, where they're praying with an intention together as a community here, okay? In connection, asking God only for boldness to continue preaching the truth. In connection with the Sanhedrin's threats, the foundation of this prayer was the words of David, who foresaw how earthly authorities would rise up against the Messiah and God himself. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. So they're seeing the Psalms, again, they're fulfilling all this what would come to pass, okay? All the, the, they continue to see the Old Testament in light of Christ as we do still today. All the Old Testament, the prophets, the Psalms, it's all Christ, Okay. We talked about that's principle number one of exegesis and orthodoxy. Everything's about Christ. So the Christians in their prayer applied this expression to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, against whom all rose up in the city of Jerusalem, so that unbeknownst to them, they might complete what had been preordained by divine counsel, the redemption of mankind and the death of the Son of God. The meaning of the rest of the prayer, according to St. John Chrysostom, was as follows. Bring those words to accomplishment and show that they they imagine vain things. In other words, they ask that God show them that it is impossible to stop the spreading of the gospel concerning the crucified, risen Christ. Finally, rather than concluding their prayer with a petition to avoid persecution, they ask God only for courage and boldness to proclaim concerning Christ and the things and wonders that may be done through his name. It's very powerful. They're not asking to be delivered from any persecutions. They're not asking for anything for an easy life. 
only that the will of God be done and that they can continue to do this ministry. It's a good reflection point for us in our own lives. Their ardent prayer to God was answered with a miraculous sign. The place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. This marvelous shaking was a symbolic manifestation of the power of the Lord that will never leave his people helpless and powerless before enemies. Their petition was fulfilled at once. And having been filled with the special inspiration from the Holy Spirit, they fearlessly stood before the forthcoming sufferings for the sake of Christ. They saw themselves as strong and capable to speak the word of God with boldness. Holy Spirit's strong here, okay? We'll notice that always in the early church with the persecutions that it's not that the Holy Spirit's not always abiding with us, but it is a specifically strong in the early we see that in the account of all the miracles that we're going to talk about uh and the, and the witness of their faith it needed to be it was it was setting a, a foundation for the church and so they it had to be especially strong uh in the early in the apostolic era had to be okay not again not that it's not with us today it is but so much powerful was it then All right, so let's talk. We got, we're in good. We're we're good on time. So let's just finish it up here on the um, next chapter on the the talk. Well, now we can talk about the community some more. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that the any of the other things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and a great grace came upon all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them, and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each as anyone had need. Going back to last week, pointing out again, this is all done voluntarily, okay? It's not forced upon them to live this manner, okay? They're all volunteering to do this. They all want to. They're all such filled with the Holy Spirit, with the expectation of the coming of the Lord in a tight, tight community that they offer this. They see themselves, frankly, as family, as blood. Who would not do such things for their own family, our own families? We share all things in common, Right? If one person needed, if I, my mother or my daughter or my sister needed something, we do whatever we can to make sure they don't go without, right? And so they just see this as an extension of their family. This is how close the community was. This is what the church was. It was a community, a family, okay? So this is how it was so easy for people to do this. But it was not commanded of them. It was not forced upon them. It was, they were inspired to do it of their own, by the Holy Spirit of their own free will, Okay? Continuing at the verse 36. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas, okay, so we um, got to see a, a new person on the scene here that will continue to come up. Barnabas, uh, by, who was named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated the son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So here we see... Now a continuation of what we will also see, this kind of tradition that we have in our own church of uh, getting renamed, okay? It's not, a, it's not a universal practice in our church, but it, most of us take on these, these saints' names uh, when we are baptized and enter in the church if we didn't have one already, right? Uh, Peter's the first one, Christ renames him, right? He, Christ uh, brings him, and then Paul, from Saul to Paul, and now uh, we're going to have uh, Barnabas, we see, whose name was Joseph. This is the form of uh, same Joshua or Jesus. <laughs> okay? Well, you'll see that uh, it's a common name. Jesus is a common name. It's a form of, jo uh, of Joseph or, or Joshua. Okay? But when we translate it in the, these scripts, you'll see that it's always used Jesus is to refer to as um as christ so there's no confusion here 
Okay. So he's a, uh, he was a, he's from Cyprus and he's a, a Levite. And so, you know, going back, the diaspora of the Jews was spread all over. Okay. This is why there's such, it's why the scriptures were translated into Greek. That's what Christ knew the Old Testament is in Greek at the time of his life. So the, 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 uh, the Jews are everywhere, especially since the, the, uh, the uh, overthrow of Jerusalem by the Babylonians from there on out. They're everywhere, okay? They're not just living in Jerusalem. They're not just in, in Judea at this, at this moment anymore. And so he's one of them, and he's wealthy, okay? Um, and he's putting his, he's laying uh, the money that he, he put in there, okay? Now, he's doing this in contrast to maybe the Old Testament expectations, okay? Um, Levites became pretty wealthy people, and many of the wealthiest were the, Sad, um, the Sadducees uh, in, uh, in Jerusalem, okay? They were very wealthy. They were very wealthy. So they made a living off of it. And you can see why there's, again, we're going to get this. Jewish authorities with Christ didn't go well. That's why Christ talked a lot about money in the Gospels. Um, talk, we had the, the Sermon on the Mount when he talks about it. He, he's not necessarily talking to poor people okay uh that hey it's not good for you to go and want to provide for your family and, and have a he's not he's it's there it's in the context it's having an expectation that there's beyond this world um that you know this is what the most important thing is but he's really in at the time second temple judaism he's speaking to these people that are gaining wealth and power in jerusalem and at the temple um against their own Jewish faith, you know, they're becoming, they're using their people. They, they, they're actually using the, the people, the, the, the faithful believers, okay? And so Christ is attracting these people, these people that are the low agrarian, poor people that are, are of his faith. He's, he's, he's speaking to them. He knows their plight. And not only because of the Romans, because of their own authority, their own Jewish authority, okay? So that's the context of, of this community, why they're doing what they're doing. They're showing that we're different, okay? We are we're fully living uh, the be uh, best lives we can, okay? All voluntarily. So. That's it for, the, that's, that's it for the, um, the text tonight. I'm going to read a little bit of the commentary for Bishop of Eric, and then I'll answer any questions you may have, okay? So on this last section here, the number of Christian community increased more than twice in size after the miracle of the healing of the man lame from birth. So doubled at this point, just because of this event. Um, therefore, the author of the miracle of healing of the, main, uh, of, the, of the man lame from birth, therefore, the author of Acts, Luke, decided that now would be a good time to give a second characterization of the now increased community to show that its inner state remained the same, that the full oneness of mind and mutual brotherly love, the sharing of property continued, therefore no one called anything his own. The apostles continued to preach with great power about the resurrection of Christ. This did not mean that they preached only about this, but the resurrection of Christ as the foundation of the Christian faith was the foundational precept of the entire apostolic preaching. Among the first Christians, no one was indeed uh, was in need because those who owned land or homes willingly sold everything and brought the need proceeds from the sale of the apostles who helped all the needy from this common treasury. An example of such generosity was Joseph of Cyprus called Barnabas, which means the son of consolation, probably because he had a gift of consoling others with his speech. It is interesting that he was a Levite that is, from the class of the ministers of the temple who were especially antagonistic to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is likely that the land he sold was in Palestine because that land traditionally belonged to the ministers of the temple, the priests, the Levites, as well as the example of the prophet Jeremiah. This was the same Barnabas, well known in history of the early church, who became the fellow traveler of St. Paul, as was mentioned many times in the book of Acts. A point, he ends here, but a point on this, this, this land in Palestine. The Sadducees at this time uh, had, through their authority and wealth, bought up all the property in Jerusalem and, and, and Judea. 
They were the, they were the owners of it. They owned it. Not the people that Jesus hung around with and preached to. They did not own any of that. You, we really have to put this in context when, he, when we see Christ battling with these, these uh, people in the Gospels. You know, these are the people he's, he's, he's battling with the elites of the world, in a sense. Kind of feel the same, you know, even today, right? There's like, we're two different classes, right? There's this elite that runs the world and those of uh, everyone else, middle class, lower class, if we even can consider that even a thing anymore. Um, but that this, they, they owed all the property. And this, he's even alluding to that, that Barnabas was one of these owners. And he sold the land there. Okay. Right, that's it. We've got about 10 minutes for any questions, discussions, anything we, about, uh, could be anything over the last chapters. I'm not, I don't, I don't know. I, I think it's like four or 500 BC. Okay. Yeah, something like that. If I, 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 that sounds right to me, but I'd have to. Seems right. Yeah. Second the ex, I, can't, I can't remember how long the exile was, but it, yeah, that's about, I think that was about right. Four or 500 BC. I was wondering why Second Temple kept getting mentioned. That is, <laughs> I understand. In the, in the what? I, didn't, I was wondering why a Second Temple was getting mentioned. I didn't understand. Oh, that there was two temples? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the original one that Solomon built was destroyed. Okay. This one's destroyed too. Uh, and just, but it's probably 40 years after this account that we're talking about right now, the Romans um, uh, destroyed it. You know, and Christ prophesied that. You know, he prophesied that would happen. So uh, in reality, you know, the, the, the sacrifice, everything comes to a halt at this time uh, with the with the, with Judaism. Did they rebuild it? And you guys said, did you guys were you guys talking about being there? You said she asked about a lily door or something. Or so Lily Gate, uh, yeah. So that's beautiful. Gate. Lily Gate is the entrance into the old town Jerusalem. That's one of the entrances. It, uh, it's actually where where J Jesus account of uh, entering into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. That's that's where he entered into the city of Jerusalem at. Okay. So it's just one of the gates into the city. It wasn't into the temple itself. I had made the illusion that they call this miracle, that you see in that diagram on the right-hand side, um, the entrance, that main entrance, the single entrance, that they call that the beautiful gate into there. That's where this miracle of the healing of this lame man took place. And I, I draw uh, a parallel to our church where our royal doors is called often the, uh, the, the, the beautiful gate, okay, as well. Uh, the, the, the holy doors that enter into our sanctuary. Um, so you, we, you have to understand that we've gotten all our, like most of our symbolism of our temple theology from the Old Testament temple. It's mixed in with synagogue worship um, and with uh, Byzantine flair, because we've inherited a lot of that over the centuries, you know, from, from the, the Byzantine Empire. I mean, that's just, there's no denying that. But that, it, it's a emulgulation of all that. Okay. Yeah. Who's sitting right here now? Nothing. <laughs> it's just empty? Yeah, they have the Temple Mount, or the, uh, I think the, the Dome of the Rock that's what I thought is, I is there. Um, that's there. where they, that's, it's where the Jews uh, saw, believe that Muhammad was ascended. But that's also where Isaac was offered to sacrifice um, by, by uh, um, Abraham. Uh, so it's holy to both, uh, both Jews and, uh, and Muslims, and I mean, to, really to Christians as well. But yeah, that's, that's what's there right now. I think it's Dome of the Rock, is this what they call it? Yeah, yeah. Well, then there's a mosque on there too, a separate mosque mm -hmm. there on the Temple Mount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, they're both mosques, yeah. Yeah, one was older. Yeah, I, yeah, there is one. I can't forget. I don't remember the name either. But yeah, they're not too far from each other. They're right there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, they built on top of it. You know, they, it's a holy site. They, they believe that Muhammad went there and that's where he ascended up into heaven. So it's our, somehow, I don't know, they're Muslim. But it is, it's a holy site for Muslims as well. Yeah. Because they parallel Old Testament stuff. They've used Old Testament understanding. So they, they, they know that Abraham and Isaac was sacrificed there as well. Yeah. Absolutely.
So, yeah, it's a very interesting time. Go ahead. So, you were speaking on how it was all about power for the uh, like. Well, not maybe not all about power, but you alluded to how they cared a lot about the power, authority. Yeah, so the authority. Well, then there was a part I can't remember exactly what it said, but it said um, that they released them. Yes. And it was uh, because maybe the masses. They might. I, I had it, but I wanted to, wanted to ask, but I. I was just wondering, is that the only reason that they let them go, or? Um. So. The, I, I alluded that is a large amount of people gathered there, and so that, but they, they couldn't deny the miracle. Yeah. Okay. And they, um, Archbishop of Erke comments that there was probably uh, people that sympathized with the apostles in the in the Sanhedrin, possibly Joseph and uh, or uh, Nicodemus, uh, uh, that were still a part of that, and so they got off on a light sentence. But um, again. In reality, it's a, it's a large crowd that's assembled outside of that. You know, they're not all into this where the Sanhedrin's meeting, but they're they're there. They you know so. Yeah, they didn't want to upset everybody. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. There's there no one's denying this miracle. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was wondering. No, and even the even the Sanhedrin, even the Sadducees, they're not denying the miracle. I mean, you would think if they wanted to bring a charge, they would deny because it's, yeah, they're yeah. they're fooling us. They're doing no, they're not denying it. They 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 know it's a miracle. So they're just mad of they're they're just they're just don't want this happening like with Christ happened. They're like, man, this guy's got he's taken over. It's the same replay, just like this. They paralleled this this. It's the same as Christ healing the paralytic. When Peter heals this man, it's very they parallel each other. The miracles parallel each other so much. Okay, how it's done, where it's done, the discussion he has. By what authority are you doing this? It's all about authority. It's it's meant to show that this is a continuation of Christ's ministry. Period. I mean, really, that's the essence of it. I like how you brought up um, what the Romans were probably thinking at the time, because after they crucified Jesus, and they were probably like, you know, it's all over. Not the Romans. The the the, the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin. Yeah, the Romans. Yeah, probably at this point, don't, really don't understand this. Christ or anything else. they don't care they just don't they just they don't want any revolts <laughs> you know what I mean the, the Jews are well known at this point they, they've revolted and this is why they've kind of got this Five thousand small armies. <laughs> they, uh, they're, they're known to kind of rebel they're, they're rebellious people and so they have issues at the time with the Romans and so they're just trying to keep peace the Romans just want peace you know um, it, they don't want anything going on you know that, that that's going to cause an issue so yeah five thousand is a lot but it's the sanhedrin they they're the ones who put them to christ to, you know condemned him to death they thought we could just end this this uh fake messiah talk and now you can see they're having like this horrible ptsd is <laughs> it happening again you know they're really having the same right they're they they arrest these guys at night uh, they they put them to council like so fast. It's really again, it's paralleling what's happening to Christ, mm -hmm. because it is Christ is still working through the church. It's the same thing. It's just ha reoccurring again. Okay. So, what about the community? I, I love talking about the early community there at the church uh, with the church because it's not what we see in our church today. We can tell that the church has developed over the years, but. But they're showing that the real essence of what it means to be church. Okay. So I'm, I chuckle because my mom and my in laws separately, they got saved in the radical Jesus movement, and particularly my in laws. And mm -hmm. that's literally what they thought church was mm -hmm. just like a hippie commune, mm -hmm. you know, where everybody sold their worldly goods. And that is kind of what they were doing. Mm -hmm. But, um, so anytime I read all, I read about that, I just think that's what they do. They just give away all their money. Yeah. All of it. You'll see the sins quick <laughs> yeah. in the church just because the number, <laughs> when numbers start in math, I mean, they just doubled in size here. So it, at, at some point, it, it's impossible to keep this up, right. you know, uh, living in that manner. When you when the church is and you'll see that the church will no longer be and we're gonna get to get into this it's not gonna be homogeneous anymore it's not just gonna be Jews and Jews of the diaspora you know as the Jews come to deny this 
uh, Messiah, that you will we'll get into it not even that much longer here, um, but they're going to be opening this up to Gentiles. And again, now we get, now we're going to have passions because now we're going to have, well, they're not, we believe the same God and same, but we're not the same. You know, it's going to be harder for people to see each other as family. You know, even though that's what God calls us to be, brothers and sisters in Christ, in his name, but we're humans. And so you will see it's going to be a lot difficult, more difficult to live in this that kind of manner. How long after Pentecost or whichever point in time did they stop attending as a whole the synagogue and participating in their Jewish culture? Like... How long do you think that went on for yeah, afterwards? Probably for a few years, for a few years, years. until they got kicked out and persecuted. You're going to see it. Uh, we get into the next couple of chapters. It's going to start beginning again. This is probably a year. They're still going to the temple. They're still going to synagogue, but they meet together and they're mm -hmm. privately for their um, for the breaking of the bread and to do the prayers as Christ commanded. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they're still very much at the synagogue and they're preaching Christ at the synagogue and the temple, and they're probably getting. This, Authorities getting tired of it mm -hmm. at this point because they won't shut up about it. They're doing it with boldness, as the scripture said today. Uh, so it's going to, you'll see the persecutions are going to come. Okay. But they're praying, they didn't pray it away, as you said. They just said, can it allow us to do it even harder and bolder? And so, so you'll see why the persecutions come. Okay. And then at that point, it's, they're getting kicked out of synagogues. Um, they're, not, they're not welcomed anymore. That's where Paul goes. Now, when we get into Paul's missionary, he, he where did Paul go? How did he do his missionary work? He went to the synagogues first. He went all through the synagogues, all throughout the diaspora. Okay? That's where he preached Christ. And then when he got beaten, he went to the, he went to the Gentiles. But he always went to the synagogues first. He, he wanted to preach there. And then everyone the only ones who were receptive were the Gentiles. That's... That's, that, that goes with uh, pretty much Paul's, his whole ministry. He was rejected, and then so he, he went to the Gentiles. Okay. All right. All right. Any other questions? We can close it up. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Let's pray. Okay. It is truly me to bless you that the Eotokos ever blessed and most blameless mother of our God, more honorable than the chair, than the beyond to him are glorious in the seraphim, who without corruption gave us birth to God the word, the very Theotokos be to be magnified. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and from the ages of ages. Amen. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. Amen. God is with us by his grace and love for mankind, always now and ever, to the ages of ages. Amen.